In the opening scene of Foragers, we see a man called Ahmad in an interrogation room. He's accused of picking Zatar by an authority of the Israeli state. He's accused of breaking an environmental law allegedly put in place to protect the plant from extinction. When asked if he's aware that it's illegal to pick wild growing Zatar, Ahmad avoids answering. Instead, he shifts the discussion from a circumstantial context to an ontological plateau by saying, I am nature. I would not harm myself. This wry but profound statement, I am nature, is the thesis of the film. Certainly nature does not hurt nature, or a part of nature would not inflict any harm on its home. So what is nature? Or what is more natural and thereby worthy of preservation in the eyes of the state? The plant or the act of picking it for food? Ahmad, living under the settler state of Israel, has been relegated to a less than human status, subservient to his Jewish counterparts. The ruling settler order has looked at the landscape and the native Palestinians as backwards, dangerous, weak, in need of control, refinement, or simply elimination. Equating native populations to wild, barbaric landscapes is a trope that has been persistent throughout the histories of colonialism and slavery. Their histories, and that of the nation states by extension, construct mythologies that tell tales of progression from barbarianism to civilization, or barbarianism to cultivation and sedentary life. In insisting that he is nature, Ahmed reverses this assigned primitivism to his benefit. This insistence takes on a counter-appropriation and recoding function to collapse the racial regime under its own artifice. So this is just a sample of um, the court hearings that Rabia, who's sitting here in the back, is the, the legal scholar that I co-scripted the court hearings with. Um, these are the court hearings that we based the, these interrogation scenes on. In some cases, there was some dialogue excerpts from the actual court hearings, but for the most part, there was just a summary. So um, it was based on Rabia's experience, some interviews I did that we wrote these scenes. Throughout modernity, every act of preservation has entailed an erasure of sorts, as well as an artificial freezing of time. Archives often do keep a record of cultural forms that are perhaps no longer present, but their hierarchies and biases tend to be part of historical processes that are at the root of the erasure of those very forms. Consider the history of museums that are at the nexus, nexus of colonial knowledge power. They store, care for, and display objects ethnographic, archeological, or otherwise, that have been displaced through colonial plunder. Take, for example, the case of musical archives, a case that I worked on in my film, A Magical Substance Flows Into Me. What I encountered in the ethnomusicologist archive is a professional desire to annotate or, or archive, illustrate illustrative types of musical forms, so to describe them, to hold them fixed, all the while knowing that in many cases, the nature of folkloric music is unstable and depends on oral transmission with its endlessly morphing forms. In this recording and categorization practice is an erasure of the native present and presence. This process is replicated in herbariums or seed banks, sites that I also explored in my films and artworks, centralizing portals that have assisted colonial expansion and extractive economies. The fateful paradox of archiving bodies is their proximity to logics and institutions of violence that render celebration indistinguishable from invalidation. Let me take a more mundane example. So think of COVID-19 and quarantine measures as also preservation paradox. This experience has revealed yet, one, yet, yet again how protecting one aspect of biological health deeply destabilizes social and mental imbalance. So the question most of the time is not if to preserve, as preservation is part of the maintenance of life, but how and who gets to decide. What I've been trying to highlight in my work are approaches to preservation that are embedded in the everyday, in living cultures that defy the institutions of hegemonic power. In settler colonial states like Palestine, Australia, Algeria, the United States, Canada, Disintegration has been a willful strategy where objects, lives, environments are left to rot, while others are prioritized for ideological, expansionist, and economic purposes. This political order that subjugates life to the power of death 
is with Ashil Membe terms necropolitics, governance that's defined centrally around the organization of death, in which ultimate justice and ultimate violence are rendered one and the same. Social and environmental fabrics are segregated and categorized so certain populations get marked out for death. I've been trying to articulate and create work that captures these dialectics of instituted and hierarchized preservation, where selective care in the case of foragers towards the plants claims to delay death for certain species while simultaneously regulating or, or the degradation of other species, um, the Palestinians, disabling them to a mere threat in need of control. So Palestine can be, can be described as a state of ruination and decay. This decay takes two forms. Physically, Palestinians are surrounded by ghosts of their villages and the ghosts of those expelled and martyred. And pathologically, Palestinians are undergoing a societal decay resulting from the unending material and immaterial violence of the Israeli occupation. Ruination is one of many theoretical tool, tools that apprehend this decay as an active process an aftermath of colonial violence that's normalized into a condition. It refers both to acts of destruction as well as the more silent withdrawal of maintenance that leads to this psychological and infrastructural collapse. I borrow from Anne-Laura Stoller's definition of ruination against the melancholic romantic gaze that treats ruins as privileged sites of reflection of pensive rumination. Rather, ruination for her is an active site, an ongoing process that is sustained by the dynamics of imperial power. Stoller's essay on ruination is a manifesto of sorts that proposes to redirect the gaze from the event, from the spectacle of violence, to the quieter, toxic, and less perceptible corrosions of violent accumulations, their durable traces on the social and material ecologies in which people live and survive. Palestinians' ancestral existence on their land and sovereignty of its resources ended somewhere in the early 20th century, around the time of the great Palestinian catastrophe known as the Nakba, which I guess all of you here know what it is, but I will say in any case, it's a term that refers to the ongoing erasure of Palestinians that began in 1948, when over 700,000 Palestinians were forced into exile and over 500 villages destroyed. The Nakba is a structure of life of continued dispossession rather than a historically sealed event. A persistent dispossession of Palestinian makes it an obvious case of thinking a ruin that continues unfolding as a calculated wearing down of populations where lives and bodies are not yet eradicated but maimed. In these dynamics of ruination and preservation, imaginaries play a central role, an unruly force that challenges that erasure, an agency within the act of ruin. The ruin that is Palestine is a site in which life is born, where we are born. It is a place of unresolved violence where unfinished histories make themselves known, sometimes directly in more obvious acts of resistance, and sometimes more obliquely as hauntings. Haunting in the appearance of ghosts, as per Avery Gordon in Ghostly Matters, is one way we are notified that what has been concealed is very much alive and present interfering with those always incomplete forms of containment and repression. Haunting raises specters, which alters the experience of being in time, the way we separate the past, the present, and the future. So the idea of foragers began with my parents. Um, for those of you who saw my dad's talk a couple days ago, you saw him as a historian and in this film as a forager. <laughs> and, um, so they, they go foraging to in this kibbutz called Tsuva that is built on the ruins of a village called Suba, uh, where the population was kicked out in 48 and never allowed to return. And today the kibbutz makes most of its income from a glass factory that produces laminated, tempered, bulletproof security glass, which may be used to display maps, live feeds from day or night vision cameras, mounted on military vehicles. Yet another example of the creativity of the Israeli defense industry, according to a review I found of the company online. The non-built areas of the kibbutz, including parts of the old village, are filled with many kinds of edible plants and fruit trees, 
making Suba a regular foraging spot for my parents. On this trip in 2014, when I joined them, we passed by ruins of family homes and collected fruit from their trees and the wild growing leaves, some patches which we can assume people collected from 80 years ago before they became indefinite refugees. The spectral force of these homes is undeniable, making them a common trope in much, much of Palestinian art and cinema as the material remnant and image of ethnic cleansing of Palestine. So foragers begins and ends with collecting food in the ruins. In an early scene, my parents are foraging in this very same village of Suba, and although the ruins are not seen, I try to make the haunting felt in the close-up handheld camera movements and layers of the sound design an eeriness in the childlike hide-and-seek game that my parents play. The film ends on my mother and her sister going to pick up Akub from Zidan, her old neighbor, in the ruins of their village, Akbara. The destroyed village becomes the final scene of love, life, and foraging. And the scene, for me, bears an acceptance of ruination that's not defeatist, but that allows for this kind of decay and recognizes it as a form of life. Within it is continuity that opposes the preservation laws and the archival logics that want to stop all of that and freeze time. So Samira Smir, who's a legal political scholar based in Berkeley, has written a piece called Before Emptiness on the destructiveness and impotence of the law. This piece theorizes the presence of abandoned Palestinian homes in Haifa in relation to the Israeli law that tries to manage them as absentee property. Much of Ismir's work looks at the foreclosures of juridical logics and the possibilities that remain uncaptured by them. In the case of these material ruins and rem reminders of the Nakba, Samara describes the building as having a force that is open to the future. For her, the emptiness of the ruin is a space of absent resolution and continued struggle. And I'm going to read the quote that's partially on the, yeah, that's there too. So the ruin might be a tempor temporospatial concept produced as an object of memory by the state and its legal machinery. But the dismembered ruin holds tempor temporospatial possibilities in excess of this concept. In this sense, dismembered ruins disclose the destructive character of the colonial state, but also set a limit on it to defy it. For Ismir, ruination is an unruly force that exists in excess of the colonial law, outside its temporal and spatial grammar of property and otherwise, thereby challenging it as they open up fields of vision sealed by the colonial present. So I, as I was preparing for this talk, I found a couple of clips. One old clip from 2014 of my mother and Zidane and Akbara. Um, I had forgotten about this and I just thought it would be nice to show it. I'll translate for those who don't speak Arabic afterwards. They're, they're ba yeah, I'll play it first and then. أما فوق بالبركية وين حياة مشاة؟ لا لا وين؟ هون هاي كانت هذا هذا حد الحجينو هذا هذا حجار دم عمرات هذا كان حد بدر الخطيب كانوا هون وين تحت الصروي يعني؟ هذا كان هيك ولا هناك طب وهاي العقدة وهاي العقدة هذا كان بيت دار ذيب هون بيتكم يعني هذا بيتنا هون 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 هاي شايف هذا المهيول هذا كان بيتنا هون آه. بيتنا القديم وكانوا هون اباوي سنتين اذا بتتذكريه هون آه. كانوا ابوتين هون آه. صحيح وكانت آه. اخرى الدار اللي بحدهم وين تيني ولا جاي آه. كانت الدار شي ثمان ايش يقولوا لها اه اه والله شاف تصور هاي هاي آه. ذاكر آه. علمني كيف احوش لوف قال لوف بدك طري وهيك تقطري لا شايفنا هاي مشكله بنجيب لكم في عنا الحمد لله yeah, so I just thought it would, I was very charmed looking at this again because it has basically so much of foragers in this little clip that I filmed almost 10 years ago. And Zidane is like doing a, a mental mapping of the village and pointing out like the different families where each home was and asking my mom, do you remember so-and-so lived here? And he's pointing on like a 
pile of stones. And, um, and then she's like, I'm going to go pick some loof, because you remember you taught me how to pick loof. And so they're foraging <laughs> um, as they're kind of mapping out the old village. And this is another clip. This is actually something that I, I shot with my eldest aunt, who was going to be the main character of uh, Foragers, but then it decided that she doesn't want to be filmed. So <laughs> this is the only clip I have of her. Um, if we have time, and I can explain later, but this is, uh, this is Qaditha, the village that they were actually expelled from in 1948 and displaced to Akbara that they were forced to destroy again. I can go into the story um, if you'd like. Sorry, I mean, I just like how my aunt speaks almost in the present tense, that Hind al-Abid lives in a room on her own here. No. <laughs> what? It's, it's so, yeah, so this is for me the haunting that I'm trying to describe in other words. Yeah. All right. So what I'd like to think more about is how cinema renders visible, felt, and embodied these subtle corrosions these non-mediatized forms of violence. Part of my interest in filmmaking beyond telling untold stories is to foreground the senses in a landscape that has been numbed by violence. The camera allows for movements from micro to macro perspectives put in relation to one another. And the magic of editing, of bringing image, sound, and rhythm into relation shares some of the logics of music. Moving within and beyond narrative, underscoring visceral experience and embodiment, highlighting the intimacy of relations. In Devotional Cinema, Nathaniel Dorsky writes about cinema as an evocation of spirit. The transcendent experience of cinema, he writes, is the opening or the interruption that allows us to experience what is hidden and to accept with our hearts a given situation. When film does this, when it subverts our absorption in the temporal and reveals the depths of our own reality, it opens us to a fuller sense of ourselves and the world. So I would reformulate this to say that cinema allows for a fuller sense of ourselves in relation to our surroundings that we have been alienated from, from the plants, the lands, and the ruins of a former life. It is one outlet for that demanding force of the ruin. Negotiating closeness and distance to other beings, to plants in this case, or in the case of my last two films, embodies a structure of desire. A friend of mine and filmmaker, Mikhail Lilov, has articulated it as such. If we speak of pleasure as a physical experience, filming plants and soil with no tripod requires a lot of physical concentration and guessing. You're moving with the camera, trying to follow the curve of a leaf or a soil particle, which induces an extremely strange state of the body. It's like you are maintaining a sense of touch on the verge of the sensible. So attempting this mimicry of plant movements and the social movements amongst them has helped me think about nonverbal cinema perhaps also non-argumentative cinema that doesn't overdetermine the presence of the filmmaker's intentions, or my intentions, but allows for the space of contemplation and perhaps that devotion that Dorsky speaks of. In my previous film, Wild Relatives, the repetitive motions of cultivation and rhythm of the seasons directed the camera movements and the edit. In Foragers, the camera work was directed by a more floating search for food, free from the hard labor of cultivation alongside the eeriness of the beauty and horror of the landscape. Throughout Foragers, what my DP and I kept referring to as the foraging camera and layered soundscape is put in contrast to the more sterile language of the court hearings and the interrogations, as well as the high drone shots, the assumed ability to determine and see it all. So Wild Relatives is on at PS1 as well. I'm not gonna show any clips or talk much about it, but if you'd like to see it, it's, it's on there until April. So the transcendental power of cinema can also be articulated as the utopian proposition of self-determination, as the site of fugitivity from the bounds of unfreedom. On the set, it is, there is a freedom to say things as one would like and to break from the reality as well as the sciences of forensics to a truthful, truthfulness of experience. Samir, for instance, who was the last defense in the court, um, seems to take the space of the set as a place to express things more easily than he would have done in an actual court of law. 
He says this law is shit and, and to, to the state attorney and that this land isn't yours and neither is the plant. So we can think of this freedom to express things as we would like as a site of rehearsal. When I began working on questions of land, seeds, and racial capitalism, it was important for me to begin outside of Palestine, since the struggle for land in Palestine is so loaded that at times I become blind to its details, and I thus decided to look close by to the complex conditions of our neighbors in Syria and Lebanon. To apprehend how the histories of colonial botany and later industrialized agriculture have been part of the internal colonial dynamics of these states. Wild Relatives tells the story of a seed bank, basically a large refrigerator that keeps thousands of samples of seeds um, for the protection of biodiversity, amongst other activities, um, that had to move from Aleppo, Syria, to the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon after uh, the Syrian revolution turned into a war. The film, the film was a framework for me to think through the history of the Ba'athist regime, the violence of industrial agriculture, and its broader post-Cold War geopolitical axis. So though Wild Relatives, through Wild Relatives and through the story of the seeds, I'm making a claim that the colonial freezing of time, so through the freezing of the seeds, also extends to life at large under industrial capitalism. Thinking through the seed bank and the history of control and displacement of Syrian rural populations also, was also related to my political engagement with the ongoing struggles that get muted. The Syrian authoritarian regime and the Israeli settler state share an approach to the population as dispensable. Both use claims of modernization, development, and preservation to suppress peasant sustenance and knowledge of the land. Wild relatives looked at the top-down relation of science to farmers and the massive ecological imbalance that resulted, while foragers explores how the law delegitimizes the relation of natives to their lands by pronouncing them a threat that must be managed, policed, and punished. So making wild relatives made it easier for me to move back to Palestine and write a more intuitive film about a problematic that I have known so intimately and that has structured my life, the life of my family members, and many more Palestinians for decades. So to conclude, I've tried to map out the relations of preservation and ruination and some of the theoretical references that have inspired, inspired me in recent years. I began by trying to say something about how my work uses strategies of counter-appropriation to de debunk racial stereotypes and hauntology as a visceral kind of cinema. And I want to leave you with an early example of a work from uh, 2013 uh, called Sketch of Manners. Um, that's a reenactment of this photograph um, of a masquerade party that took place in Palestine in 1924 at Alfred Rock's house. So I'll just, I'm playing five minutes of the 12 minute film um, and then we can go into the Q&A. So Kane, can we get the lights off? Thank you. It is April 1942 in Jerusalem. In the news, Germany dominates the war in Europe, from France to the center of Russia. The Americans and the British look unprepared. Palestine is on the outskirts of the war. While the rest of the world seemed to be committing suicide, Alfred Rock was throwing what was to be the last masquerade in Palestine. 
Rock, member of the Palestinian National League, was a landowner and a merchant in Jaffa. To end the Arab revolt, he was invited to attend the London Conference in 1939. During the day, he discussed the question of Palestine. By night, he explored the parties hosted by the colonial lords in their hometown London. He brought some of the costumes back with him. The exhaustion from the three-year revolt had settled upon the city. The Palestinian leadership was in jail or exiled to the Seychelles Islands. The voice of the British mandate was fading, while the Great War continued elsewhere, it seemed. Questions about forage. <laughs> I have a like a pen and a paper, but I caught you say something um, that for me is trying to take a kind of broad perspective on Palestinian cultural production, particularly through film, which is the opposition between a kind of forensic sciences, the evidentiary and the real, uh, versus more of a sort of experiential, um, embodied um, sort of encounter with the landscape, and so. Can I get you to comment on a bit of the mm -hmm. sort of distinctions between these two things? It's just something that I've been thinking a lot about. Right. I think, um, particularly in relationship to like typical tropes that like Palestinians are historically producers of documentary because we're constantly invoked to produce fact uh, versus you know, the Israelis uh, produce the Godard uh, famous fiction. And this sentence. is Godard's like famous kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fiction. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the famous sentence by Godard is that Palestinians are the um, 
material or the people of documentary and Israelis out of fiction. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what can I say? I mean, I, I, you know, this, this idea that if we present the facts, things will get better has like failed <laughs> enormously. And not just in Palestine in general, I think this whole belief in, in media and documenting as the solution to um, justice um, yeah, has, has changed greatly, like from the Vietnam War, if you think about the impact of the photographs being printed in newspapers back in the US in the 1970s versus today, like nobody cares. So it's, there's been kind of a desensitization towards photo, video, images of violence. And, um, and that's not to say that these, tool, these are not yet still important tools and that they're, it's very important to document and it, it's good that forensic architecture exists and, <laughs> and many other centers that are... So, um, and because it's a, it's a tool within the, 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 the current uh, legal justice system. So they're kind of mimicking the tools of power in order to um, make change. So that's, you know, so long as it's working, I support it. But... Um, yeah, I mean, I think motivation for me and many other artists is, is not about uh, putting facts on the ground. I mean, I think truth is, is about a kind of a kind of truth searching of some kind. So there is this kind of search of the essence of things or like a, a processing crystallization of ideas of, of a spirit of some kind. But it's, um, it's not about truth in the legal sense uh, in that way. And it's, this is why I tried to talk about it as a, like a, the truthfulness of experience for that to be um, transmitted uh, in a way that doesn't try to compete with those kind of argumentative forms because they, you know, they, they reach, they actually shut off people very often uh, rather than bring them in. And so, yeah, so. Thank you. Um, I have two quick questions. Well, two questions. Um, one, um, I was wondering, how did you manage to um, yeah, film those sometimes quite difficult scenes? You said, I think, in the beginning that the um, court rulings were <coughs> reenacted, so I guess there was, uh, that was easier, more easily done, but um, there were scenes where you were also filming the park authorities. I'm just wondering, how did you, how did yeah. you do that? Um, and the other question refers to the act of preserving seeds. You, you said that you went to Lebanon as a starting point and then went back to Palestine and mm -hmm. you saw the, the seed bank. Um, and after what you've said about museums and preservation, I kind of had like a visceral reaction. Like you mentioned, it's like a freezer, a fridge. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's a, it's a way, it's a counter um, act to, to the regime that makes, makes it impossible to further cultivate those seeds. So I was wondering, how did you feel when you visited the seed bank um, in mm -hmm. relation to what else you said about preservation? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, these are my two questions. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the credits, uh, if you watch closely, reveal how the film is made. <laughs> so the film is staged, uh, and they're all actors, the patrollers, so you can see the names of the <coughs> actors. And um, So the entire film is staged with a mix of actors and non-actors, but um, nothing is just shot as it's happening. Everything was planned. And <laughs> Uh, rehearsed and yeah in some cases dialogue was memorized and in other cases there was more improvised but agreed what we're going to shoot more or less so including the um, tire smashing yeah yeah <laughs> that, was, that was the most expensive day of shooting <laughs> um yes um so maybe i i wasn't clear about the seed bank the seed bank is moved from syria to lebanon so I didn't visit any seed banks in Palestine or Israel, for that matter. But it, that's that I could I, I I could I mean that's uh, not. I mean the one in Lebanon. Yeah. Okay. So the one in Lebanon. Um, it's an international seed bank. Seed bank. It's not a national seed bank. And you know what I'm interested in is not um, is is to is to think about how these archives are part of an inheritance of violence. So how the seed bank that claims to be part of or it is actually protecting biodiversity. The seed bank, it's, it's an institute called ICARDA. They have one of the world's largest collection of seeds from the Fertile Crescent or Mesopotamia, or, um, which is, yeah, the most important seeds for f humanity's survival and future. Um, but this institute that houses the seeds belongs to um, the CGIAR, who, are f who were funded in the 1970s by the Ford Foundation and Rockefeller Foundations, to, to build 
uh, agricultural research institutes across the global south that will fight communism. That was kind of their motivation that if agriculture will be more um, profit oriented and have kind of capitalist models of production and, and export or export and farmers will start making more money basically that they will be less likely to join uh, communist parties. So it was a very politicized program that came with the industrialization of agriculture that destroyed the world, you know, that brought about the climate change as we know it. So it kind of proliferated seeds that needed chemical inputs and irrigation and all of these things. So these very seed, so some of these very important seed banks today are housed by the institutions that propelled the Green Revolution, which was the scientific revolution of industrial agriculture. So it's, this is, I'm, I'm more interested in the paradox, and I think that's what I'm talking about in a lot of these projects, is how th this is the paradox of the same institutions that are claiming to protect and preserve are those institutes that erased in the first place, that erased that biodiversity and displaced the seeds from the farmers as the Israelis erased the flora and fauna of Palestine and Palestinians' access to their land. So that's the kind of preservation paradox that I tried to flesh out. Hi. Hi, thank you for coming. It was a beautiful film. Um, I have two questions. So how do you navigate filming your parents? Because I imagine it's kind of like it might be more challenging to film a more intimate relationship than with strangers or with actors. And second, um, I think this was kind of answered by your slideshow, so you don't have to answer it unless like if you have anything else to add for what you consider when representing Palestine for an English speaking audience. Representing Palestine? Yeah, through film, or like a Palestinian story. Yeah, just representing Palestine to the West or to English speaking people. Can you, sorry, can you repeat the question? Like, I think it could have been answered by your slideshow, so mm -hmm. you don't have to yeah, add that part anything I heard, more. Yeah. <laughs> but um, if you consider anything else when you're representing Palestine oh. to an English-speaking audience. Wow, I, okay. I, I am representing Palestine, but I'm not thinking about oh. representing Palestine. <laughs> not, I, not in, a, I, not in I, like a... You <laughs> no, I understand. Not diplomatically. But a part, a part of Palestine. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm I'm not necessarily thinking about representing it to an English-speaking audience. I mean, that's not that's not the starting point of how I'm making making the work. Um, you know, I, I I used to say that I make work first and foremost for my friends, not for abstract audiences. You know, I think about colleagues and people who I'm in dialogue with, other film other makers and other. Um, they're kind of the first kind of conversation partners that I have in mind and who I show the work to before it gets shown and distributed. And then it's kind of beyond my control in a way where the film travels to and, and audiences respond so differently to the film. Um, so, you know, yeah, so I don't, I, I have to say I don't necessarily think about it along those terms. You know, I think more about... Um, yeah, some of the, relation, the relationships that I... That I that I try to talk about in the film that uh, relate to Palestine, but also beyond. I mean, I'm in the center of Palestine study, so I also wanted to focus on Palestine, but um, not all my work necessarily deals with Palestine or tries to represent it in that way. But, but sure, I think the imaging of Palestine is kind of a big, big deal. It's something that we all think about, like how like the reclamation of the image, because uh, you know the the occupation is is also a war of narratives and images and 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 in and if we think about it or not culture ends up playing a role in that so it ends up being part of that battle but um so there is a kind of motivation that is political but i yeah i'm i'm going in circles because i'm, I'm not sure what to do with this burden of representation yeah i didn't mean to put a burden on this no it's all right it's it's all right it's a fair question um, and then I guess to my first question, it was like how you navigated. Oh right, my parents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's difficult. <laughs> it's, it's really difficult. Um, I uh, yeah. After I filmed with the magical substance, I thought, okay, I'm never doing this again. You know, like it's, it's really it's you know they're difficult in different ways. <laughs> my parents, my father. Um, has a hard time accepting the role of being an actor and not director. So. <laughs> so, um, 
And my mother was very tense with the camera, with the magical substance, my uh, previous film where, where they're featured. Um, this film, she was wonderful, but I had to talk a lot in preparation to her and tell her, listen, you're going to be the main character of the film. Are you ready for this? Like, are you going to be more relaxed about it this time? And, and I found the trick, uh, and it's to put her with her sisters. Because <laughs> then she can't, then she can't act, you know. Then she's does, then she's really just herself, and um, that also was in, like instructive for me, also of how to be a better director, like how to also put her in situations where she can't but be herself or um, perform without being too aware of the camera and her performance. And but it's it's really difficult. Also, when I finished shooting this film, I said like I'm never doing this again. Like. <laughs> Um, like it's it's very very tiring because we do several rehearsals and we agree on things and they just don't do it <laughs> because they're not actors you know and maybe they're not the best actors although I think they're wonderful on camera and my parents are quirky wonderful intelligent people and who I uh, who I really love and their lives somehow continue to humor me and inspire me and so uh, maybe it's not the last time but yeah. it's <laughs> Um, my, I don't know if this is working, so I'm just going to keep talking. But um, I had exactly the same question as you about the control. Uh -huh. um, and as part of my question kind of related to that, um, I really liked that you said that you kind of like the space between, I don't, I don't really know how you framed it, but it, made, it just made a lot of sense because in a lot of your films, there's so much space for the viewer to kind of just interpret the images. It seems like you're just laying them out for everyone. And I'm wondering whether, like how you think about your role as the filmmaker, as this kind of observer um, in situations where there's like, there's tension or there's people coming together who wouldn't normally come together. And I thought about that in relation to the patrol, so maybe it doesn't mm -hmm. actually apply. Right. Um, but whether you have some sort of a uh, way that you think of yourself when you're in these situations, when you're filming um, or kind of presenting these images. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm more the manipulator than the observer. <laughs> Yeah. So that's what I'm realizing. Yeah, yeah. Now. It's a major manipulation. The all the whole um I think like filmmaking as a it's a what's what's the word? When you kind of take advantage of other people's situations the word? Uh, when you kind of are like a leech. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I, huh? Yeah, that's what I feel often as a filmmaker, that I'm kind of leeching onto other people's lives and like <laughs> So it's it's not very obser it's observational, but more than that, like um, people give a lot when they kind of uh, come and <clears throat> come on camera. And um, I mean, I think I think that, I think it's freeing to know that it's just a film, you know, especially when there's actors and a script and so on. And I think that's the fun of also shooting, and that's what's <clears throat> it's almost therapeutic that you you're able to stage situations that you fear or that you hate and shooting them, like staging them and shooting them is a way of also dealing with that fear or anger and and coping with it. And then it becomes less uh, threatening somehow. So I think that's that's the nice thing that cinema also affords. Are a lot of your films staged? Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I guess I've been, I've been, dis I've been manipulated. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I guess I'm mostly not asking a question, but like noting how I especially like the scene about uh, the Arabs trying to farm, but not exactly succeeding at it. But uh, like just seeing how staying connected with the land happens in this like uh, with this risk of it being now illegal and all that. I also like thought to the example, and this is like informing the audience here of. Uh, Another example of uh, in the village of Bilain, it's uh, really west of Ramallah, really on the close borders, the green line and the separation wall. It's actually reclaimed land that a hero of the Intifada owned it and basically leased it to a co to what's now a community farm, yeah. a Muslim man farm. And uh, it's like, again, this act of resistance and actually like continuing to planning and not just taking what the land has to provide and keeping it so mm -hmm. just sort of like that example and it's uh yeah. it'd be nice to see across the different landscapes of what's like the 
interior and then in the West Bank. It's mm -hmm. just nice to see. And Thank you. Yeah. You mentioned this. Yeah. So a comment and a question. A comment is, what an amazing film. Thank you. Because <laughs> in, in part, it, it just builds slowly. And, and, the, and then when, you, when the, the, these individuals that you kind of get to know a little bit, right, uh, go to the court and you get so angry. But there's a, there's a kind of a ripple of, uh, you know, just authenticity of what's happening on the ground through them in a, in a way. But I, I work about four blocks west of here at the Inner Church Center at the Interface Center on Corporate Responsibility. And for 70, since 1971, we've been working to try to change corporate behavior, human rights, labor rights, environmental issues. But more recently, the last five, 10 years, we've become, we're, we're shareholders in those co companies. So mm -hmm. we utilize that as a strategy. But I, I kind of connected, uh, you know, a theme that we're working on with your film, and that is working uh, globally with a lot of uh, human rights defender organizions and networks th all throughout the, the, the world, Middle East, Latin America, Asia, et cetera. And what I've learned from our partners on the ground who are fighting these fights and, you know, sometimes losing their lives, right? They, they, they really talk about, and we've now talked about it, it as ground truthing. And the ground truthing really being what, what, you, what you've done in that film, which is essentially, you know, to really, uh, instead of all the theory or sometimes, you know, like international NGOs can make the strategy as opposed to really ground truth it with communities that are, are really at the epicenter of the struggles. And so I, I just saw your film in that context where we're working so hard and of course, it, how do you change all these big companies? It's really, but one of, one of the ways that we've made some progress is to really get engaged in, uh, you know, these networks that are just, you know, they're, they're ground truthing in the sense that they're, they're emerging not only the, the data or the realities of the oppression, but the strategies as well. So I just really felt a, kind of a kinship with what you're trying to do, uh, like so many of the partners that we work with, that without that, we're just kind of like, okay, we'll make up a strategy. That's not the way change happens. Right. Thank you for sharing. Excuse me. Oh. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, captivating film it was amazing, very inspiring too. And thank you for like guiding us across this landscape. It was really nice to have that like handheld throughout the entire film. Um, but I wanted to ask about. I noticed it was a uh, an absence of children, and I noticed one reference to children, and I was wondering like what what role do they play, if any? But also like how do you think your perspective of rumination affects them in the further generations to come? Mm. Yeah, thank you. That's a beautiful question. Um, yeah, there's not so many children in the film because it is... Um, it is mostly the older generation who are still very much tied to these traditions of foraging and the cuisine. You know, there's there has been an alienation from the land and the food tradition, so a lot of younger generations don't necessarily care to eat that food as much as their parents or grandparents did. But at the same time, there is also kind of what your comment on Um Sliman was and, you know, my work and many other Palestinians who are kind of um, going back to the land. And that's kind of a trend, let's say, around the world of trying to get back in touch with land and um, other ways of living and eating and... Um, but when I was kind of meeting people who had encounters with the patrol, it was mostly elderly, uh, elderly people. Uh, Rabia, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's mostly elderly people who are also trialed. Um, I just, yeah, I mean, it's correct, but I think last couple of years ago, maybe a year ago during the pandemic, there were four kids in the West Bank. It's a photo that yeah. you did a lot uh, that were handcuffed uh, during while foraging. You will find it sometimes, but Jumana is absolutely right. Um, it is less common. Yeah, than yeah, yeah. That image went viral of a bunch of kids going to forage Jakub and being really violently detained. 
Um, so that 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 was the reason, and also again because you know I chose my parents to be central characters with Zidane. Um, so there is sometimes there is cases where the kids of you know will join their parents on foraging trips, especially those who are making money from it in the seasons because they go maybe a whole family. But but those who are doing it just more out of the love is it, it is mostly elderly people and. The ruination affects everybody. I mean, the ruination is—it's—it's it's just a metaphor, really, for talking about the like living under perpetual um, occupation and a state of incarceration of some kind, you know. So it's—it's—it—it uh, it, it, it is the reality in which we are born into, and in which kids are born into, and kind of learn how to express themselves and be. And um, so, yeah. So in that sense, it's a, tra a transgenerational trauma. <laughs> Yeah. Alessandra? Um, firstly, just to echo what everyone else has, has been saying, really beautiful film, really touching. And um, when I'm looking at these shots of the ruins, um, I can't help but think about this, like, this long history of Israelis kind of appropriating this aesthetic of the ruin in this kind of romanticized right. way and turning, you know, ruins that they themselves created into this uh, sort of biblical um, remnants or whatever. Right. And I'm curious what a sort of politics of ruination might do in conversation with romanticism, both by Israelis and maybe also by Palestinians. Um, and I, yeah, I'm just wondering what the relationship you see there between ruination and romanticism. Right, yeah, so I think, I mean, I'm, I'm borrowing this definition from Anne-Laura Stoller's essay on ruination, um, a <coughs> book on kind of, um, on debris, on colonial debris. Um, and I kind of like that she's trying to differentiate ru ru ruins and romanticism from ruination. So, um, so ruination is not kind of a, like a gazing at the ruins. It's the, uh, it's the act, it's the, act, the active state of the ruin, both as a force of destruction, as something that's kind of an ongoing perpetual violence, but also, the ruin as a place out of which life is just kind of being born and continued and where resistance is also coming out. You know, I talked about the hauntings, but it can be, you know, we can talk about it in different ways. So I think that's the politics of the ruin. It's, I think, again, it, sh it shares with a lot of different theories that are trying to bring in a new vocabulary or kind of this set of terms to talk about what it means to be in such a inheritance of, of violence, you know, and I think there's, there's connections also to the black radical tradition. Like I'm reading now Christina Sharp's book on, on and, and this, this notion of the wake is like so pertinent to Palestine and it's annoying that she doesn't mention Palestine, you know, like there's no, she's like, con, at, at, like so close to it all the time and describing this condition. Um, and I think that's, that, that's what the politics of ruination of Palestine that I'm trying to articulate in a way that it is, it is both something that's constantly corroding the society and people, and it's not something to be romanticized. It's not like, but it's but it's also just out of real, you know, out of pure reality. It's also the side of which culture and resistance and life is um, is articulated. Um, so so that's 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 kind of it. Um, I think we're going to take the last question. So there's only one. Um, so one is just a technical, curious question. Uh, when did the law of uh, foraging go into effect? That was my first question. But I was also really curious about your opening shot. Uh, um, your opening shot yeah. with a drone, mm -hmm. right? Because to me, it's like this double-edged sword, right? On the one hand, it's like these methods of control and surveillance. But on the other hand, it has this beautiful kind of sense of being enveloped in, in, in the landscape, right? And being part of that landscape. So I just was wondering, you know, what will kind of some of your thinking in that setting up that stage in such a way? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that was the most difficult um, decision to take, the whole drones. I, I do rough cuts with friends before I finish the film, and every time there was a discussion on the drone. <laughs> uh, because, you know, I initially introduced the drone into the shooting because I wanted it to, to perform that kind of military gaze, as I was saying, in kind of contrast to the more foraging intimate camera. Um, and I felt that because the, the, there's only two drone shots actually in the film, there's the beginning and then there's the other shot that kind of comes down on Zidane and seemingly catches him like from the sky. And um, 
that shot was clear to me that I that it should be there. The the shot of catching Zidane like through the through the drone, and I felt I needed to establish it elsewhere in the film so that that is read as a drone and not just as a camera. You know, so this is why I, it was important for me to have one more shot and for it to be early in the film to establish that kind of surveillance gaze. But you know, the fact of the matter is the camera also does more than that. You know, it, it, even if it is coming from the technologies of surveillance and, and, and military, you know, um, uh, killings and so on, it's, it, it also now is used within camera technologies. It's very, you know, it's, it's, it's everywhere. So I think this is, this is where it's, it's, referencing, it's referencing that military language, but ultimately also is, is doing more than that within the film. So... I, I agree with you. Basically, I agree with your reading. <laughs> yeah. Did you, did I? The foraging, when was it? Is oh, yes, sorry. Um, so Zatar was banned in 1977 together with Miramiye, which is Sage. Um, and in 2005, they updated the law and added Akub, uh, which is this thistle, thistle plant. Is it all over Palestine? It is. It's both. I mean, the film is shot mostly within 48 territories, but the, the ban um, is enforced also in the West Bank. Uh, there it's enforced by the military. Um, and so there's a close collaboration also between the, the Israeli Nature Parks, Parks Authority and the Israeli military on the border control. So uh, they kind of uh, surveil together and share, share the information. Yeah. Um, I think that's it. Um, okay. <laughs> I just, I know that there might be a ton more questions about the foraging and the laws. And so I just wanted to do a shout out to Rabir, um, who did a podcast for the um, Center of Palestine Studies last year called uh, Ed Impossible oh. Foods. Oh, criminal Foods. Uh, criminal Foods um, in the Palestine In Between podcast series. So if you guys are interested, check it out. Um, on every imaginable platform. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming and yeah. just join me in a round of applause for Jemana. Thank you. Thank you.